Over the quarter, we have been studying a number of abstract ideas. We have studied phonemes and morphemes, and of course, all of these ideas have a history. There's someone who proposed the existence of phonemes, and then there were people who did research to try to prove the existence of phonemes. The history of syntax is particularly interesting because it intersects with the history of psychology and of the social sciences during the 20th century which is why I want to tell you a little bit of the history of generative syntax. It ultimately revolves around this question. How do humans learn language? Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at phonological rules, morphological rules, all those things with the trees. And how can it be possible that children learn all of these patterns? Not only that, but they must be learning them incredibly fast. If you see how a child acquires language, you notice that after three or four years of listening to a language, for example, English, they will speak English. They're learning way faster than an adult does. So how exactly are they learning? Are they learning language the same way they learn everything else? Or are, there, are they learning language because there's something in our human nature that primes us to learn language as if it was an instinct, for example? Deep down, this uh, philosophical debate is called nature versus nurture, which is, has been going on for hundreds, thousands of years, actually. How much of our behavior can be explained by our nature, like our genetics and our biology, versus our nurture, for example, our human cultures or our upbringing? We now know, of course, that both of these have an influence in the behavior that we find in humans. However, it has taken a lot of research to figure out that both of these ha uh, make a contribution. And for a long time, people only focused on the nurture aspect of language. For example, if you traveled 100 years ago, in the past to 100 years ago, and asked a psychologist, how is it that people learn language? They would have told you about a theory called behaviorism or behavior psychology. They would have told you that living beings have behaviors because they are reinforced to show those behaviors. They would have mentioned Pavlov's dogs, for example. Ivan Pavlov was a psychologist that trained a dog to salivate whenever they heard a bell, which they associated with food. So if you have a living being and you reinforce some behavior, that living being is going to learn this behavior. There's a famous psychologist called B.F. Skinner, which extended that idea into language learning. And it said that our sentences of English are a condition of hearing a lot of English over our lifetime. We get the input, which is all the sentences of English we've ever heard. And then we get uh, positively reinforced if we correctly reproduce those sentences of English. Or we get punishments, negative reinforcement, if we don't reproduce those sentences correctly. So we have input and um, conditioning to tell us whether we're speaking right or wrong. However, there is some evidence that there might be more going on. Learning by reinforcement and conditioning assumes that we learn language just like we would learn any other thing. But there is evidence that language is not learned like other behaviors. And that as a matter of fact, maybe your brain has uh, its own module, its own bits and pieces that are dedicated to language. We call this modularity, uh, the idea that maybe there's something in your brain that's uniquely dedicated to language. One uh, idea that supports this is that when you get your input, your information about English, you might be depending not just on the input, but on internal co cognitive processes to produce your language. So if you learned like, like a rat, you would just hear sentences of English and then try to repeat them. But this is not what humans do. What humans do is take that input and then try to, then try to fill it in with some kind of linguistic rule. We see this in a process called over-regularization, which is very easy to see in very small children. For example, if they have to say the plural of foot and they haven't heard it before, 
they're not going to say, oh, I can't say that. They're going to try to produce a plural with whatever words they have. And they're going to produce the wrong plural, foots, because maybe they haven't heard enough of the word feet yet. But notice that even if they haven't heard it, their brains are still trying to do something about it. There's still some cognition, some thought process that goes in independent from the stimulus. Children are going to generate words like foots, tooths, and goad and comet for the past tense of went and came. And children do this all the time. They're manipulating the stimulus in um, very intelligent ways. They're not just repeating. Another bit of evidence that there might be something special to language is that there is something called a critical period for language learning. Children learn language incredibly easy and incredibly fast. If you, if you put a one-year-old into a community, they're going to learn la the language like it's nothing, and they're going to learn it perfectly. Whereas if you ask a 25-year-old to learn a language, it's going to be really hard. Um, there is a critical period when we're very young where it's easy for us to learn languages, and then that changes. This has to do with our biology, with being younger or older. And it is not a function of intelligence, for example. Um, no matter how smart you are, it's going to be difficult to learn languages when you're an adult. And it's going to be, uh, for every child, it's incredibly easy to learn languages when they are small. So there's something different about learning languages when compared to other skills. Finally, languages uh, language appears to be separate from intelligence and from other parts of cognition, so much so that maybe language does have its own little part in the brain. This is an example from a phenomenon called aphasia. And aphasia is an injury in your brain which affects your capability to use language. But it might leave other capabilities intact, for example, your intelligence. This is a patient with Broca's aphasia. It um, affects your capability to remember words. So someone with bro Broca's can't remember words. They might have the linguistic structure, but they're not going to be able to, to bring the correct words into their sentences. And this patient cannot articulate words, but he can clearly think, understand, and he can even think mathematically because he's going to answer to a question of how many children he has with, the, with a number and the correct number too. Let me load it. However, we All your children are grown, right? How many children do you have? Can you count that out for me? Mm -hmm. So as you can see, he understands the questions. He, uh, he can answer, but what he cannot do is retrieve the words. This might be evidence that the part of, of his brain that was damaged dealt with language, but is separate from other uh, procedures, uh, from, from other processes that deal with intelligence, for example. So there's quite a bit of evidence that language might be special somehow. Maybe there's something in our nature that makes language something like an instinct that we're programmed to do just like birds are uh, programmed to learn how to sing. Some researchers have proposed that we do have some sort of innate mental structure that is dedicated to language, maybe a module, maybe a set of rules that we're born with, and we're going to call this universal grammar. Universal grammar is the idea that all of all human languages have essentially the same underlying rules and then we adjust those rules as we face our input so if we are babies and we have to learn chinese then we're going to set our universal grammar switches to the settings of chinese if we're babies then we're born in an environment where they speak spanish we're going to set the switches slightly differently and all languages would be so similar that if a linguist from mars came along and analyzed them, this linguist would say that, yes, all human languages are the same, except for a few switches set here and there. Here comes the question. What is the exact shape of these rules? This is the work of linguists. People have been trying to figure this out for 60 years, and research is still ongoing. Some people have proposed that this X-bar theory is something 
that may be part of it in our innate rules. Some people have proposed much simpler versions of universal grammar, saying that what's innate in our capability for language is just to join elements together. And by the way, this theory of thought um, has been spearheaded by a linguist called Noam Chomsky. And yes, here comes a major disclaimer. As you can see, this theory has been fought over for 60 years, and some people have devoted their entire lives to try to see if it works. There's other linguists who think that this is all rubbish and that essentially language is learned like other general, uh, general cognitive skills. Uh, functionalism is such a current of linguistics. So if you want to see linguists getting riled up, ask them what side of the debate are they on on this. This, um, I showed you one way to explain syntax, which is X bar theory. There's many other theories of syntax. But the summary of this whole thing is that this idea that maybe there are trees that are that we can use universally to explain every language comes from this question how do humans learn to talk or to sign languages is it because we learn them by ex extrapolating from input or is there something special to our human brains which fills in the blanks from our input to then generate language are we born with these rules? If we're born with them, then all humans would have the same version of the rules. And so all human languages would be essentially similar. This current of thought is called generativism. As I mentioned, there are others. I just showed you one theory of syntax.